Everybody, welcome to another one of the Bitcoin podcast interviews. Uh, today, uh, we are joined with uh, a team that has been joining us many times over the years, over our stint on the air, the radio waves. Well, it's not radio, it's a podcast waves, <laughs> right? Uh, and that is the team at Ubiquity. Welcome back, team Ubiquity. I'm going to introduce everyone. Go ahead. What's up, man? Let it rip. Oh, hey. Um, Nathan, I was just I was sending a video of you speaking to uh, our uh, VP of marketing, and then it just played your voice again there. So we, you were just hearing yourself. Um, so sorry about that. Um, Nathan Wozniak, founder and CEO of Ubiquity. It's been a few years since I've been on the show. Just happy to be here. Um, I think I, I like you guys pretty much Bitcoin OG. That's <laughs> been in the space for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's great that you guys have stuck around and, and kept growing your show. And now it's a network, which I think is cool, of of pod <laughs> Bitcoin podcasts. I mean, you guys have grown. You guys uh, have an awesome professional studio now, it looks like. And uh, butt, so. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are pros, let me tell you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, this is we're joined by Nathan. Uh, he's the CEO and founder. And also, um, he said this, I didn't. Bottle washer. <laughs> <laughs> at ubiquity <laughs> and then which you know i know it takes a very delicate touch to wash bottles um <laughs> and then we have darcy the chief revenue officer hello um, hello are you also the chief expenses officer all or the things a, all the work? things the same way and, and just, community organizer are you like yeah. i'm only focused on the money coming in okay revenue <laughs> only all, all the things that so we, we keep a good eye on it. And I'm based here in Salt Lake City, Utah. So saying hello from the West, West Coast. Nice. And also by Wes, uh, who is the VP of product. Welcome, Wes. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm also located on the West Coast here in California. Okay. I used to be in the West Coast. Remember in Vancouver, but I moved to Toronto. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, um, what's, I mean, is the West Coast of Canada like the same as the West Coast of the U.S.? Yeah, like, same same time zone. Well, not the time zone wise. I mean, like culture wise, like Silicon yeah. Valley out there. Yeah, the very much sort of more hippie hipsters. We have surfing in northern uh, Vancouver, which oh, it's cold. <laughs> uh, you know, north of Vancouver in some areas and British Columbia. It's and um, yeah, it's pretty much that kind of hippie culture. People were in the grunge scene back in the day. I guess now the grunge resurgence with Gen Z we're seeing. So you're, you're dating yourself with that one. Yeah. <laughs> 39. <laughs> I was looking back. I mean, y'all were some of the earliest guests that we had on the show. I was looking mm -hmm. back. So the first one that was, I guess, representing ubiquity was episode 43. And that's when we had Matt McKibben and Christian Saucier. McKibbins and, like, and Saucier. We yeah. even had like a wow. quality theme song. And we had some, we, we did like the buddy cop show for that one. <laughs> McKibbins and Saucier. McKibbins <laughs> and Saucier. Um, <laughs> I wonder what you were on like there, four yeah. other times I'm seeing here. Four other times. Yeah. Like 16, it gets uh, episode 69, 98, 122, and 198. And now 69. this one, 367. Wow. So that's a big grip. Wow. Yeah amazing well obviously we have some catching up to do so Corey's had a baby congratulations uh, thanks big congrats marcello is now jesse <laughs> <laughs> yeah <Nice. Hi>, jesse. <laughs> that happened uh no um sorry jesse i'll let you take it out man you you never met nathan so you you know ask you, you yeah so well, nathan, what is ubiquity <laughs> it's everything it's everywhere it's everything. Okay. It's uh we are a startup company that uh was founded in 2015 and we have been really focusing on the real estate industry we we're focused we're, we were broadly focused on the real estate industry when we started blockchain and real estate um for two years no one really even cared about blockchain technology in terms of the real estate space or really i think anyone outside of 
our communities. Um, and then over the years, basically aligned ourselves with the right team. And uh, Wes is part of that. He's worked in the title and in, uh, insurance industry for 25 plus years. And uh, we have some other folks that have joined us. And uh, so now we're focused on the title and escrow world. So mm. not so much of a niche market, but uh, yeah, we're US based, based in Delaware. And we're obviously we're a global team. I mean, our team here is the US based on in Canada. But we have two team members. Uh, one is in Germany and one is in Chile. So we're oh, wow. officially global. <laughs> Mm. Uh, we focused we, we built um you know a couple different products um but we can go into that if you guys want to go over that later but um we built a few products well smart escrow which wes will be happy to go into that was his idea and then also a product called Blockstract. so so yeah, yeah. we'd love to go into those products yeah. let's go into those products let's save the best for last for, sure. first uh, before before we do that i want to wait uh, before we go directly into that i want to yeah. ask like a more broad a more broad question and that is why do you feel this, I guess, overarching area of business is amenable to blockchain, right? Like, like I think when we started, right? Yeah. Back in the day, if we go, if we go back to the earliest episode, mm-hmm. it was, it was like we were in this kind of concept that blockchain is a panacea almost, right? It's like, what can we put on a blockchain? And we were just throwing everything at the wall and we've, People have continued to do this for a long time. Um, mm. We've had this conversation in previous episodes, but some people more listeners haven't heard those things. So, like, why do you feel that this niche of business is amenable to a blockchain, and in, in particular, Bitcoin? If you're still solely working with Bitcoin, well, we're not. Um, we were. I mean, we were when we first started, right? I mean, we had the first. Remember that. F- I think we talked yeah. about this. I think we actually announced it on your show first in uh, April of uh, was it 2017, which was the first pilot in Latin America mm-hmm. in Brazil, and that was in like the Pelotas area of Brazil. And um, we always felt like, well, you know, the land records offices there um, are, are obviously open to. There's a lot of fraud and corruption, and I think that the, the parallel recording system, like the blockchain, can really help with um, giving transparency and openness, and then like, accountability as well. Uh, and then having a record of ownership that can tie back to all of that. I think that was probably the big highlight of why we did this. But I think, you know, Wes, would you be able to opine on on perhaps focus maybe more on the specifics of how it could help title? You know? uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so interestingly enough, when I uh, uh, when I met Nathan back in it was like 2000, late 2017, 18, early 2018. Yeah. 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 Um, my, my background was the title insurance industry. So when I first learned about uh, Bitcoin, which is in early 2017, when I did a deep dive into it, you know, with Satoshi's white paper, and then obviously every everything that came after that with Ethereum and smart contracts and whatnot, I, I immediately saw um, applications to my industry um, with respect to the escrow settlement portion. And then, so I, I started my venture uh, into looking as to who was working in you know block the blockchain industry uh, and, and applying that technology to my industry and i came across ubiquity and eventually met nathan and um the the, the, the sole focus was was land records you know can we put land records on on a blockchain and is that is that better than the current than our current system that we have now and uh, so nathan well, while nathan was working in in that area um you know trying to gain traction i, I think that you know after after we had talked it was um he had found that you know yeah we can do it but um, yeah. is there is there a budget that these counties have to even adopt blockchain and then nope. is, it, is, it a, <laughs> it is, a, is it a viable business model to continue down that road i mean ultimately and when you look at it the, the companies that are working in this space putting you know trying to put land records on a blockchain they're doing it as uh, an unpaid you know pilot program pilot. for the most part so i mean yeah. I, nathan, nathan nathan can talk about all that i mean his you know, sure. Trial yeah, yeah. Relations working with these land record, uh, these uh, land record offices, record office, exactly. And I mean, we do have a connection to you know Darcy having her connection to the county clerk in Utah, who's really been the, the forward thinker on that. And perhaps she can go into that after I speak of the negative experiences. Um, this has been a long journey, guys, right? And I, and I think I feel like really we're blessed that we got into this so early because it gave us time to tinker and mess around and really bring and bring the right team together um, and the right advisors. And we just realized, well, 
counties either <laughs> don't understand blockchain technology, don't have a budget for it, or they simply don't have enough constituents like in that area to be able to facilitate this, right? They just don't have enough people to make it even worthwhile to even like put the budget and time uh, dedicated to it. And we were able to quantify that because we did freedom of information requests on all the, the counties that had been working with um, uh, our competition or indirect competition. And we discovered that none of them had made money off the counties. They were all, as Wes said, uh, pay, uh, free pilots. So we avoided that <laughs> and realized that we needed to actually build products and and probably not not actually partner so much with the counties, but rather the e-recording vendors that actually work with them to kind of piggyback on their existing contracts rather than having to go in there to do a bid. Um, that was really a, a big headache. And so we thought, well, uh, it's also expensive and we, like justifying the cost to recording into a blockchain and even like say some of the more affordable ones like Proton. We're going to, you know, big shout out to Proton. It's one of the ones that we're supporting. Marshall Hayner, he's a Bitcoin OG. You guys might know him from this in the space. I've known him since 2013 in the Bitcoin space. Um, and we just found like it's just too expensive and, and it's like such a huge undertaking to do uh, re- history of ownership of land records for any county going back how many years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, it's just expensive and probably not worth anyone's time. But Darcy, you there is someone who's like a superhero out of Utah. And she's yes. a superhero. Like listen to her name, Miss Powers. Yes. Yeah. So what's exciting is my really good friend, uh gosh, we've been friends for about a decade, Amelia Powers. She was she became the Utah County clerk about three years ago. Um, and so during that time, you know. Utah County is the second largest county in all of Utah. So keep in mind that they had, with the elections coming up, the previous in the 2018 election, with the, under the previous person, their election process was a disaster. So Amelia coming in new and in then into that role, she realized she had a lot of work to do. And so she set her sights on using blockchain technology in order to solve some of these problems. So um, she's made she's made inroads in two areas within blockchain. The first one being um, she just de- she decided, hey, it's silly that we have this process where somebody has to walk in to get their marriage license. Like she wants to make this all online friendly to get a marriage license, right? And even even still, I've been with her getting nails done when she officiated somebody's wedding, so she can do it virtually, and then it gets reported <laughs> in Utah County. And let me tell you something. Th- she saved so many people's bacon during COVID. She was literally officiating weddings virtually for people living in New York City, for people in California. Israel. Yeah. yeah, even Israel. She opened it up to the world. And so this is what's super exciting is she's by, by being creating the using the efficiencies of doing everything online and using blockchain, she could then literally officiate a wedding and send somebody a certificate within like five minutes post ceremony, right? So it it tra- it dramatically changed things for Utah County, but it actually opened it up to the world. And she just said, "Hey, if we're doing this here virtually. There's no reason why we can't do it outside of the state of Utah and even the world." So that's an exciting space um, that she ventured into. And then the other second area um, is even the voting space. So. So what she made available and it just launched during the 2020 election was that if you were serving overseas in the military as a member of Utah County, you could vote on the blockchain uh, for the 2020 election. Or if you consider yourself a person um, with disabilities, you could also vote on the blockchain. So what was really exciting is I was helping out uh, with Brock Pierce's presidential campaign back in October. A friend of mine and I, we were his Utah directors. And so when he came into town and I had a meeting with a whole bunch of people, elected officials here in Utah, um, what was really exciting is we went ahead and had my dear friend, Josh Daniels, who at the time was the deputy to Amelia for as the county, Utah County clerk. He went ahead and cast his vote for Brock Pierce on the blockchain. It became the first presidential vote um, to, in the history of the world. And that happened for Brock Pierce out of Utah County by Josh Daniels. And we actually since then have made an NFT of it. And um, <laughs> check out NFT the movie and you'll, you'll hear more about it. It's pretty fun and exciting. But these are some of the innovations and exciting things that have happened here in Utah. And right now, I'm, I'm an advisor to Ballot Tech and Ballot Tech is working on their solution. And we're, we're, and t- we're actually setting up our partnership 
with Balatech and Ubiquity right now as we speak to pr- move things forward. So there's a lot more innovation to come that will be made available to counties all over the United States. Is and that ballottech.com? It is ballottech, yes. I was waiting like, for somebody to like put voting on the blockchain. Well, I, awesome. yeah. Coming from a security perspective, voting... Like, I have a couple questions here. Voting on the blockchain is incredibly nuanced. Um, it, it, like, because I don't want to... It, I think more often than not, the moniker of it's secure because it's on a blockchain gets used, which isn't necessarily the case. And garbage and, in, garbage out. <laughs> yeah. And, or like, I mean, there's also a tremendous amount of other things uh, that are nuanced around uh, not having privacy, but having like forever records of, of someone's decision on some, something like this and the security of it, it being able to be manipulated uh, in the process. Uh, so like, I'm weary and many, many security researchers are very weary of doing such large scale votes on, on a blockchain. And I'm curious to see how ballot tech is doing this. Uh, and, and because I, I hope, because like eventually it will be the right way to do it, but I'm not necessarily sure that the privacy and security tech is there, uh, to, to do that on such a broad scale. And, and secondly, when you say voting on the blockchain, which one? We're currently in the Cambrian explosion of blockchains, um, and not all of them have the security, scalability, censorship resistance. Um, that, like, there's, there's, they're not equally secure and private in any way, shape, or form. So I'm curious, like, what can you can you maybe drill down a little bit as to like which one you're using and and why that's being chosen and how that kind of works. So as of right now, we have not yet done the backend development integration. The tool that was used in the 2020 election in Utah County is not the same as Balotech. Balotech is still okay. in development. Cool. So just know that that was a local solution selected specifically for them. But let me tell you something. People send millions of dollars on Bitcoin and other things every day. I can tell you this can absolutely be done right, made secure. And obviously when it is, all of those things come together then our solution would be launched. So it's all yeah. to be seen. I'm not, I can't speak to what blockchain is going to be solution at the moment. And uh, just so you, just so you're aware, uh, we've, we've also considered the idea of dual recording. So using multiple blockchain simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So yeah. all, all, all opportunities and solutions will, when it's all complete and baked out, then we're happy to open up um, to your questions on it. Great. Just yeah. hope to stay informed on that. Look, I'll uh, I'll definitely push Bitcoin <laughs> first, just because of the decentralized nature of it. Um, I'm not a maximalist. I consider myself a, I guess a crypto middleist. <laughs> Try to be rational as possible, seeing whatever use case is, is relevant for you know whatever product. But I I'd love to have Bitcoin for that as a default. <laughs> you know, I don't know about Ethereum right now, just because of high transaction fees and stuff. But these are pretty rough these days. For sure. Yeah, I worry about scalability issues that kind of thing the I mean, scalability you're going to run into scalability scalability issues across the board especially when you're talking about something as as massive as even the election process of a single state yeah right yeah for and sure if you try to expand that out to the country for something like presidential voting then it becomes even 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 more serious of an issue uh just yeah. just with scaling in mind um and i'm not sure there's anything right now that can handle that type of load that isn't uh batched in some way like uh True. Like, there has to be some type of batching mechanism that then, like a, you know, a roll up is the canonical like analogy for this type of thing, where you take it all, you batch it together cryptographically, and then you plant that into the blockchain. Uh-huh. But like, uh, and you can do these types of things ostensibly with Taproot on Bitcoin, and maybe further down the line. But like, I'm curious to see where this stuff goes because I have no doubt that voting will eventually be done on some type of blockchain technology. It's a matter of getting there and not screwing something up in the way that then like uh, like slows down that progress of getting to the point where like that's how we do it. Yeah. Was was the Crypto Kitties issue with Ethereum? This is going back a few years. Was that mm-hmm. a network congestion issue or was that like a scalability issue or both? A little bit of both. Uh, oh, okay. So at that time, I would say 
there was like you can only do i think it was like 12 to 17 transactions on ethereum and yeah. it blew up because it was basically the only thing you could do at that time uh with especially with nfts it was a game that everybody wanted to play mm-hmm. and it just like everyone was trying to do so much at once and the amount of money that was being made within crypto kitties was so high that people didn't care and it just it just ramped up the gas fees similar to like a lot of what you're seeing with dexes and airdrops and all the current stuff that's going on on right. ethereum it's like the current bandwidth of layer one is only so much and every time something happens everyone tries to do it and the amount of money that's being made in the process of doing it is so high that they don't care about transaction fees and it's because of that yeah. they basically elbow out every other type of thing that can be done until they're done with whatever they're doing and this is this this goes back all the way to the early icos if you look at the early icos of ethereum um that same thing happened. It just happened in a smaller time scale because the ICO sold out so fast. But within that time period, those blocks in which the ICO was happening, you couldn't do anything else. And yeah. people were paying ex- exorbitant gas fees. Uh, and so like those things will tend to like happen until the scaling solutions that people are working on get implemented and work and show that they work. And I'd argue the same things have happened in Bitcoin for various reasons in the past. Is like like the a lot of the block debate was because blocks were full and then segwit happened and that gave a little it eased up a little pressure uh bitcoin cash uh forked off which is a large user base of transactions that then have their own blockchain to do whatever they want and, and so like that mitigated some pressure it's like these types of things continue to happen and i mean even andreas has talked about it like it's this like scale gracefully type of thing like whenever there's room people will use it and the, mo- the moment you give people more room, they'll find another reason to fill that room up. And so like, and but over time, you get more and more and more use cases and you get better and better and better things. Like we, there's, you know, we could do this type of video conferencing yeah. on the internet when we were using AOL. No. Nope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, uh, it's the thing that Andres and I've talked about on our show before is like things don't scale until they have to. Right. They, they just don't. That's just human nature. Right. We didn't know we needed, you know, stoplights until we did. It's like, oh, it's a lot better than it was because before then we were just crashing into each other and that wasn't great. Right. And then we developed, you know, stoplights and then highway systems and these huge interchanges that you see in cities. Uh, but except for Louisville, because the interchanges suck here. Shout out to Louisville uh, city <laughs> planners. Uh, but. Uh, but you know things don't scale until they have to and that's just always going to be like that like there's there's nothing that's ever going to change that it's not like somebody's going to come in and say like oh i've got the scaling solution to solve them all no you don't what, no, no you don't what's, yeah. what's interesting about this is that i remember having a conversation with you nathan mm-hmm. uh on one of the episodes or maybe it was that one of the dinners that we went to or like we talked about how the use case that you were using for ubiquity was good because relative to the to the to the to the fees of bitcoin at that time the cost of doing these title transfers was so high that it didn't matter right or like it was a use case that worked for for doing something on bitcoin that was just that was different than just trading bitcoin because right the the the, the transaction fees didn't matter because everything else was so high and also like the the time for transaction finality didn't matter either because the time it takes to do trial transfers was so long that an hour is like oh this is wonderful right and so correct like and and back then we were trying to justify the concept of doing something else on bitcoin uh because you know high transaction times and and high fees but like as this stuff scales out it becomes one of those situations where like we start like more and more use cases come on that were previously were like, well, that's stupid. You'd never do that on a blockchain. But as we scale out, you're like, oh, that makes sense now. Let's do it. That's right. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And and it's um, I think it's interesting how things have just kind of uh, changed so much over the last few years. Um, I think definitely with a lot of the new solutions, especially with DeFi. I mean, my goodness, just I <laughs> I, I know this is a weird segue. Maybe I'm just thinking all out here about like, you know, where we've been with the company. And I had no idea that we would even be considering any kind of DeFi integration. And I guess technically we would be now with smart escrow, right, Wes? A little bit, because we're going to be tying into Proton's system and trading between different stable coins. Yeah, I mean, at, at some point, I mean, I, 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 that's what I'm thinking. But um, 
Yeah, we and you and I have had this conversations only because I I love to think about these things. Yeah, um, you know, learning about uh, tying real world assets to metaverse uh, properties and then integrating DeFi into that. I, I think all that's so super fascinating. But when you yeah. but when but when we're talking about creating solutions for regulated industries like you know the title insurance industry, that's that's a different story. Uh, yeah, obviously De- DeFi ha- has its regula- regulatory issues and. Um, I mean, it's 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 difficult when, um, it, 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 difficult meaning that that when when you have, when you're creating a, you know decentralized financial solutions in, in a way where you're not you know where you don't have a, a centralized organization that kind of controls everything, that's different. I mean, at some point you're always going to see centralization at, at, at some aspects of it, um, which is why you're seeing you know the SEC going after what Uniswap now. Um, it, because they they can they can find somebody a person uh, you know an individual or a centralized organization that they can go after is that going to take down the entire industry probably not but you know I think their intent is to send a message uh, to the, the DeFi industry as a whole um, yeah. I I have my own opinions about whether or not you know um, regulators are going to be successful in you know taking down a, an entire decentralized um, ecosystem. But uh, but but as far as like getting back to to what we are doing with the title industry, yeah, you know, the title industry is heavily regulated. Um, it's state specific um, when when you when you're dealing with real property law aspects. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is create a solution that that accommodates for the the, the existing regu- regulation um, uh, with within that industry. So. Um, I mean, I could I could talk about what smart escrow is and, and this and and the problem they're trying to solve there, but um, uh, why not? We're launching it this month. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Please. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so well, well, let me start at the beginning. Um, so the reason why that we we came up with this concept, uh, and, and I'll get into that what, what that is in a minute. Um, uh, I've been I, I when I started looking at uh, uh, crypto and blockchain. And its application to the real estate industry, um, I, I started seeing articles about people um, purchasing real estate with cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin. So you'll see you'll see an article that says somebody bought a real estate with Bitcoin, but but what they failed to to uh, to state in the in these articles and up until now is that nobody's buying real estate with Bitcoin. There's no there's no peer to peer transaction where you don't where you're not, where you're excluding a title company or an escrow company. I mean, you can do that, but the tr- what happens is, it, when you buy real real property, real estate, you have to do a title search. You have to confirm ownership. You have to confirm liens and encumbrances against the property, yeah. and then there has to be some intermediary that 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 handles the the transaction, clears all those title defects. So the purchaser, when they buy the property. They get clear title to clear. I mean, it, uh, this is a you know broad um, you know overview of how it works. But they get clear title to the property that they're they're not they're not getting uh, the property subject to any existing liens or encumbrances that they have to worry about. Right? They're going to get clear title to it. And if they borrowed money to purchase the property, then that's going to be um, uh, on their title uh, as well. It's going to be on their, their their title policy that shows that this individual, the buyer, borrowed money to purchase the property and. There aren't any senior liens, liens that have priority over their current lien. So, yeah. I mean, in a nutshell, that's kind of how title insurance works, and that's how our system here in the U.S. has worked predominantly. There is no state-run guarantee. Well, some states have a state-run guarantee system. In other words, Iowa, I think, right? Iowa, and there's yeah. a few other jurisdictions that have like a hybrid model. But in other words, t- title insurance is kind of like a necessary evil. People purchase it. Because it gives them protection, and if someone claims uh, uh, superior title to their property, that that per- the, the individual, the, the the owner of the property, doesn't have to come out of pocket and 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 pay for the cost of defending their title or even curing title. The title company will step in and defend their title, and and obviously. Um, pay for the cost of the, the defense or curing the title. right. And Wes, I'll, I'll say as a side, I'll say as a side chain to this um, is side note. Side chain is it's lame. We say that internally in our company, and it <laughs> never gets old. <laughs> but um, it's like dad jokes. Is um, that 
you know, we knew that our competition and there were like other, even other people within our organization that used to say, hey, we're going to like uh, disintermediate and disrupt title insurance and get rid of it. We're never going to need them. We're going to have a DAO and we're going to replace the need for lawyers. And oh my God, it's going to be kumbaya. Um, well, I'm glad that we never really took that approach and we try to be really warm to the title industry. And we've, I mean, there's a big four title insurance company and they, I won't say the first part, but they end with Republic. <laughs> so you can guess who that is. Um, mm -hmm. We four years ago, they're like, you guys are going to completely destroy our industry. Oh, my God. Stay away. We're going to fight you. This and that. Well, then there was stuff released by the American Land Title Association a few years ago. A lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt. And I, I actually blame crypto media, not you guys, but mostly crypto media for perpetuating this kind of stereotype and, and lies <laughs> and misinformation about what we could do that we, as an industry for the title uh, title and real estate space. And so fast forward now to a couple of years ago, 2019, which the last time I was able to actually go to a conference in person uh, wow. in Austin um, at the Ulta One Conference, American Land Title Association. They had people speaking about blockchain technology. They had interviewed me. They had been speaking like in a very positive way. And now we're Ulta members. And so, you know, it's just things change. And the industry is starting to um, actually adopt it and, and, and test it. And now um, First American, like the second large title insurance company underwriter, has done some stuff on the blockchain as well, which Wes could describe in, in good detail with their starter exchanges. So the, the tide is shifting, the attitude's changing. And I'm really happy and, and honored that Ubiquity had always kind of come in and say, hey, look, like we come in peace. We're just another vendor. We're just another prop tech company rather than we're here to seek and destroy and disintermediate and, you know kind of an immature mindset. Mm -hmm. So, so it actually helped us quite a lot. What, what I need help with um, yeah. is understanding like this scenario right here. Like I, I, I buy a house. Yeah. And I think it's dope, right? I've got the title and I'm happy about it. I frame it, put it in my office. I'm like, this is it. This is my home. And that's the title. And then somebody knocks on my door and they're like, hey, are you in this house? And I'm like, yes, because it is my home. And they're like, well, it's mine. Look at my Coinbase wallet. I have the title digitally, and this is my house. And I'm like, well, fuck you. And I close the door to my house and I go back in my home. Like, who's, how do we resolve that conversation? Because that's going to be a real conversation. Yeah, yeah, right? totally. So you're right. So most most laws are written uh, when when it it's called basically um, it's it's called constructive notice. Notice that is given to the world when you record your deed in the county in which the property is located. So most states' laws, in order for you to have a superior claim uh, ownership rights to, to title to your prop to, to your home, you have to record your interest in the county in which the property is located. So that's pretty much across the board in every state. So there is no law, state law, that says you can give notice of your ownership rights by recording it onto a blockchain. So that would be secondary secondary notification or, or evidence, which does nothing in the court of law. So, so say, for example, someone gave you a deed and you just held on to it. I mean, that's legal. You can legally do that. So if if someone hands you a deed, says I'm giving you my I'm giving you title to this house, you take you accept the deed. You don't record it. You own it. You don't record it. And then they could that that same person can then give a, another deed to somebody else, and then and then they didn't know about your claim. They go and record that deed. Well, they would have superior rights over you because they recorded their interest. Is that the claim you. fraud or something like in New York? That's predominant. I mean, yeah. they have they have obviously a cause of action against a seller, but but as far as as far as who owns the property, it's typically the one who either records first or and give and gives notice without any prior knowledge of the, of the other mm. transfer. So, so so you so but but you have to but you have that that's why title companies exist is because they they understand these uh, these laws. And, and they undertake all the due diligence to make sure that that deed gets recorded on your behalf, and then you get a title to the property. So any so before even blockchain existed, this is how it all worked. People mm -hmm. people had this misunderstanding that blockchain was going to solve the issue of ha having title insurance at all. They said, 
we're not going to need it because we're going to look at we're going to look how to how Bitcoin is created. We can see the Genesis block. We can trace every transaction from that from the from the the Genesis block up to now, and we can all we can go back. We can see all those transfers, and we you know we know it's secure. Um, you know we don't have you don't have to question it. And so they were trying to adopt that same principle in in this industry. But at the end of the day, our laws are written in a way that don't accommodate for that. So un- unless it gets changed in some way, we're still subject to the old rules and, and the old uh, way of doing business when it comes to, to to real estate. But but that's that's not. I mean that's that's really not what Ubiquity is trying to solve with with smart escrow. What what Ubiquity is trying to solve with smart escrow is the issue of when you purchase real estate, rather than having to, con- to getting back to my what I had said before, when people talk about buying real estate with Bitcoin, what they have to do because Title insurance is kind of title insurance and escrow are kind of this necessary evils that you have to kind of uh, under you know to undertake in order to get clear title to the property. Well, the title companies and escrow companies won't accept cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange. You as the parties can can agree to contract for that, but title companies are going to say we're not going to accept it. Um, we're going to want you to convert that crypto into fiat dollars in order to settle this transaction in the traditional way because they have to. They have to pay existing lien holders, and most existing lien holders aren't going to want to accept crypto. Um, they have to pay taxes. Taxing authorities aren't, aren't going to want to accept cryptocurrency. Um, Not yet. That's that's why that's why we're creating this. So so the industry is the title industry is a very is a very slow moving ship when it comes to adopting technology. I've been in this industry for almost twenty eight years, and yeah, even now it's just like when when COVID hit. That's when they started to, to start um, adopting a lot of these new technologies, like remote online notarization. Yeah, That's been right. for years, yeah. but but now all of a sudden they're going, well, maybe we should consider that. Even e signatures too. So I mean, we we, we had the e sign act, and, and and but everybody was still kind of apprehensive about uh, doing any of this until COVID hit, and then all of a sudden it accelerated. You know this this whole process, but even then, it's title companies are very slow moving. And, um, and and there's a lot of companies, tech companies, that have gotten involved in the title insurance industry, trying to change it, make it more streamlined. But they're yeah. still running into difficulties because mm-hmm. of the existing laws and regulations and, and, and yeah. practices surrounding. Um, and, and Wes, so so going back to the not to cut you off there, but you know, going back to there's a company. I mean, it's BitPay. I know that BitPay is effectively the only one that's a, that's doing that that we know of, the, the largest one. But there's still off the off ramp is still a fiat. Yeah. And so our benefit with smart escrow is that you're not going to have to do that. You're not going to have to off ramp it. And in fact, maybe go into the stable coin solution and well, Hey, why they would want to use that. And perhaps even uh, good funds laws, if you want to talk about that, Mr. Mm-hmm. Attorney for ubiquity. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so, so, so a lot of these transactions where, where the title companies are accept where they won't accept crypto, but they will accept fiat because obviously they have to settle the transaction in, in us dollars. So there's really kind of only one solution out there. So, um, and the one solution I'm saying right now, it's been it's been around for years is BitPay. So BitPay to accommodate a lot of these transactions have worked with uh, the title industry to um, when, when a buyer wants to purchase real estate with crypto, uh, they, they don't they don't the buyer doesn't fund um, doesn't send money to escrow in the way of cryptocurrency. What they'll do is they'll con- the BitPay will act as an intermediary to convert the the crypto into to to, to U.S. dollars, and then they'll they'll transfer those funds into escrow. So mm. that's that's kind of how it works. And they don't. And obviously, BitPay is limited in the type of crypto that they'll accept and that they'll convert. I mean, it used to be just Bitcoin, and then they opened it up to to, to ETH, and I think um, uh, Bitcoin Cash. I, I don't even know. I mean, I, I'm maybe in Doge now. Who knows? But but my point is, um. That's kind of how it works in this in, in this industry. So if you want to, if you're claiming you're going to purchase real estate with crypto, you're going to have to convert it. And that that that, that was where we saw the issue is that we felt that the title industry needed education as to how cryptocurrency worked, and um, and try to educate them on why they should accept it. Because if the parties want to contract uh, for for to purchase real estate using cryptocurrency. Why not allow them to do that? And why not be able to settle in, in, uh, in a cryptocurrency for that purpose? And obviously, Bitcoin wasn't going to be uh, the, the, the medium of exchange to do that because traditionally, uh, 
the escrow companies aren't going to hold a volatile currency um, that's going to be fluctuating up and down and then have to accommodate for that. Um, so what we, what we had envisioned at Ubiquity was let's you know let, let allow them to do it in a stable coin, which doesn't fluctuate. It converts one to one with the U.S. dollar, and that way maybe not um, tether most of the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> but 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 that that was kind of our, that was kind of our point, you know. Um, yeah. And then and then and work with the industry to educate them on how crypto works and 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 allow the parties to the transaction if they want to um, uh, to settle in cryptocurrency and 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 the title company to, to allow them to disperse uh, funds in a crypto in, in a stable coin uh, a cryptocurrency. And then uh, if the counterparties to the transaction want to accept a cryptocurrency, allow them to do that as well. So we've uh, we've built Ubiquity's built uh, uh, escrow wallets. So we, something uh, something akin to uh, I mean, if you're if you're used to using Coinbase or another t- uh, another type of exchange wallet, this is something kind of similar. So basically, the escrow company will have have their wallet. They'll um, based on each transaction, there'll be a, a, a counterparty wallets that get issued. So if we'll have a so if if there's an existing lender, they'll have a wallet. Um, uh, the taxing authorities will have a wallet. The real estate agents to the transaction will have a wallet. And when escrow uh, uh, is in a position to fund the transaction, in other words, if all the conditions have been met uh, with respect to the to the escrow to allow them to, to disperse funds, uh, they'll go ahead and disperse in a stable coin. The counterparties will receive uh, their funds in a stable coin. Um, you can trace the transaction, obviously, via the blockchain. So it's transparent in that regard. It avoids, um, uh, we believe it's going to uh, avoid anything like a wire fraud. Because we're not dealing with wire, uh, you know, uh, wire transfers anymore. We're we're doing everything through these wallets. So as a, as a side chain to that one, you know, most people when they, they buy a home, they have to wait what seventy two hours for that to clear a wire. Mm-hmm. And if they're buying it internationally, remember we were talking with Marshall Hainer from Proton Metal Pay about that last Friday, and he was saying like, oh, if you're buying a home inter- like internationally, say you're in Europe, and you want to buy a home in Canada or US, it could be one hundred and twenty days for that wire to clear. Yep, exa- exactly. <laughs> so you're so you're not that long. It, it's, it's up to yeah, yeah, yeah wow. and, and you and you have to wait. I mean, there are certain times where you can can actually fund because you have to uh, you have to wait for uh, uh, there are uh, uh, wire transfer times that you got to you got to comply with with with, with a lot of these uh, uh, with the banking um, uh, system. So yeah. uh, this avoid. I mean, and this you can actually fund and disperse at any time. You don't, obviously you don't have to you don't have to wire you don't have wire cutoff times and things of that nature you have to deal with. I mean, there are so many benefits to this. Yeah. Um, but obviously, there are issues in place. Like, title companies are worried about what, what's called good funds, and it's what's what's kind of interesting is it's good funds. Basically, in general, is, to, uh, is that the laws are written to make sure that there are no clawbacks of funds. So, as you know, you can you know it, when when someone sends money, they can always reverse the transaction uh, and and pull the money back. Well, you can't do that in, in with crypto, right? Once it settles on the blockchain, it's done. You can't claw it back, theoretically. So that, that so it, the technology actually avoids any issues when it comes to good funds. But title companies are still have to deal with that when it comes to uh, crypto because a lot of these a lot of the good funds laws are written based around U.S. dollars and 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 mm-hmm. uh, our fiat currency. They're not based on cryptocurrency. But we're like I said, this is all involved. This all involves educating. Um, the industry, as well as regulators, as to why they, they, they should settle in crypto rather than the yeah, dollars. But so that's but, basically what we're yeah. creating. I, I, I've got like a like a general okay. question. Uh, sure, um, sure. For Wes, what, what what has, in your opinion, contributed contributed to the largest change in opinion, or I guess um, acceptance by the industries involved? As far as changing the opinions, I think uh, just there's there's more information available now um, mm-hmm. that there wasn't before. So you know, in, in early 2017, I felt like I was kind of shouting from the rooftops to my industry, "Hey, there's this new technology." But to be honest with you, I, I found that there was very little information, so I had to dig for it to even educate myself. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, as Nathan mentioned, a lot of um, uh, press about you know by our by the crypto industry that hey this technology is going to disintermediate um uh title insurance and you know if there's not going to be any need for it so 
the industry kind of took a position as, hey, wait a second, you know, who are these people? What are they talking about? And, you know, let's find out more. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so all they were doing is kind of trying to defend their own industry uh, to to the crypto industry who said, hey, we're going to disintermediate you. And so, so I think now that the the shift has changed in that what's, uh, you know, what's interesting is funny is that as we've been, as, as Nathan and I had been in this, you know, talking to title companies and, and we've been educating them on the benefits of it, their mindset is, well, we want it kind of like back in the early days when everybody wanted a a website, I I want a .com. I don't know what it is, but I want a .com. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of how how the industry here is. We want blockchain. We don't know what it is. We don't even know how it's going to apply to our industry, (laughs) but give us blockchain. And yeah, so we blockchain. Have, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or uh, we want to own the blockchain, and that's always my funniest one. <laughs> and that comes from the top. I think we've also started to see government adoption. Sorry, I'm in an Uber on the way to the airport, but we've started <laughs> to, to speak at the Blockchain Real Estate Summit in Austin, Texas, representing Ubiquity. Hey, hey, shout out to <laughs> Austin. Well, we are starting to see government adoption. We have the Government Blockchain Association. We've had governments around the world adoption, yeah. right? El Salvador in June has adopted Bitcoin as their official currency on par, equal footing with the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar started to be their currency, I think, around 2003. So Yeah, MS-13 loves it. <laughs> since, June, since June in El Salvador, and I know I, I know, because I'm privy to some discussions about other countries that are right now courting certain cryptos to become official or a dual currency. So Panama just did that, I believe. We are watching it before guys, this is happening. You can't stop it. The revolution is here. Oh God! Right, Ron Paul, 2012. I don't. So uh, my, uh, <laughs> right, I feel right, like right. I feel like. Let me just get this out there. I feel like every industry feels like Sorry, they're going to be replaced, but realistically, there's just going to be like way more intermediaries. Yeah. I mean, and of course, right? Like, the laws aren't going to change. Right? That's that's the problem. We started out. We started out with this idea that you know, oh my God, this is going to take over everything, and yeah. then we're like, well, we're not there yet. Uh, why don't we just try to make things more efficient? And also, like, these things don't happen – they're not mutually exclusive. It's not one or the other, right? And the process of making it a very inclusive technology that allows you to do so much, like, the industry you're trying to take over is going to use it too. And they're going to be like, oh, you know what? This actually – a part of this or all of this helps me do my internal business way more efficiently. And they're going to yep. adopt it and use it for that matter. And then – then there's like different use cases for the exact same technology. And I don't want to call it infighting or like they're not butting up against each other. It's just, it's just using a very, very general broad technology to do a bunch of different things or yeah. adapting parts of it to make the like retro tech or like the, 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 the technology that's trying to be innovated on better and more efficient at what it does already. Yeah. And starter exchanges and, with first American. Of course. And yeah. and so like that that's just that you see that across the board and it's not going to stop happening. It's really a matter of like what you want to use this tech for and whether or not it's going to be useful for it and exactly. like whether it fits in. Precisely. Like in, in some cases when you look at when you look at like completely private companies trying to use blockchain, uh more often than not, like you like I'd say like look at the enterprise blockchain play for the long time on the Ethereum ecosystem. Why don't you hear about it very much? Because it's not that much better than a database for the majority of use cases, because you don't really give a shit about whether or not it's open and permissionless and you can enter and leave the system without no, without anyone knowing who you are. Like the whole concept of using something like that for a private, private enterprise is that they already own it all. It's when you start dealing with a bunch of different people who are advers- who are potentially adversarial or like the concept of a blockchain and, and is worth the inefficiencies it brings to the table. Yeah, ab- absolutely, absolutely. Well, we have we've actually had a good luck with. Um, we've been so happy about the uh, the the title industry. So we we have title companies that have signed on. We so we have Millennial Title is a new partner of ours. Um, they have presence in what thirty plus states, I believe. Um, we'll be dealing with them in Midwest uh, and Florida and some other regions. We have Millennial Title. Or excuse me, Millennial Title Rainier Title, um, which is in Washington State. We have a two year exclusive with them in that state. But then we also have other title companies that will will have a work share agreement through these partnerships. Um, we have a New York title company that is looking to get on with us as well. And you wouldn't believe it. We've had uh, two title insurance underwriters as well as two banks. And we're talking uh, one of the one of the well, top 20 largest banks in the U.S. I won't say which one it is. 
is extremely interested in what we're doing. I'll be getting letters of intent from them, as well as a um, a, a a bank that has a crypto bank that's in Wyoming. And it's just been phenomenal. And I, and I think why why are they coming to us? It's because they have a demand from their customers to buy uh, property with crypto and they don't know what the heck to do. And so they probably Google it and see that we're probably the ones that are saying the most sane things to them in, in words, yeah. in language that makes sense to them, right? If you go to the smart escrow.us website, I'm giving a big shout mm-hmm. out to that. So, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a growing demand for what you guys are, are attempting to pull off here just because, I mean, just personally, I've seen one request this year of someone mm-hmm. who's like, hey, I want to buy this house, uh, yeah. but I want to be paid in Bitcoin or yeah. sorry, sorry, I want to build this house and I want to be paid in Bitcoin. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, that is a whole I mean, that's a very challenging transaction believe it or not, the way everything is currently set up. So um, I have some questions, though. Like, what about so you guys have been going for many, many years. Like, how much do you have some like any metrics, like any vanity metrics that we could speak to? Like how many like a volume of transactions or ubiquity has facilitated X amount of, you know, titles like give us some uh, give us some numbers. Yeah. Yeah. We got the chief revenue officer here. What kind of public numbers can we, you know, get to everybody? Well, so it's good. A car. We don't know how that's going to work out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she is in a car. Maybe. Well, you know, that's a tough one because, you know, we've, the, the, the title companies we've worked with, believe it or not, don't want us to disclose many of those numbers, but we've done thousands of transactions through AIC title service. That, that's an aviation title uh, and escrow company, the one of the largest private in the U.S., um, and they were our first customer. And, and so that one, you know, was thousands and um, ran, ran their system for years. Mm-hmm. And so we've done that um, in terms of, you know, with with Rainier title, it's been a bit delayed. There was some other some things that came up. So that's been delayed, but we'll be finishing up their project this year and we'll be starting to record titles through through them and they're a very large title company they're, they're buying up all the title companies uh you know in the state of washington and i'll have some really good metrics and we'll be actually happy to disclose them uh if bill bergschneider wants to even maybe come on the show as a follow-up we can discuss that uh, he's the ceo um and discuss how th- those things are going but we've definitely done thousands of transactions um uh, i would say f- probably five thousand in in about a year uh which doesn't sound like a lot but i mean it's <laughs> It's parallel no, reporting on the blockchain, right? I want to. I, 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 I got a question. I think this is more relevant for for listeners too. Is that yeah. I got, I'm looking to buy some more land? Like I want to buy some land because I think it's it's valuable. And yeah. how do I start the process of making sure that I use a service like yours? What do I do? Because like, that's not something that I'm necessarily familiar with. So, like those who yeah. want to buy a house or buy some land or real estate or whatever. How do they include you into the process so that if they have crypto assets, they can use them to do the, to do this? Uh, yeah, I um, I would say, well, Wes, I mean, we have, we have a gentleman. There was a guy on Twitter. <laughs> he was I won't, I won't point him out who it was. He can look through maybe our, our, our conversations here, but uh, on Twitter, like back and forth. But a guy who was a little bit confused and he's like, well, I have this, you know, I live in, in Florida. How do I buy this property with Bitcoin? And I just forwarded him off to Millennial Title, who happens to be in Florida, and they can they can help him. So I would say maybe pass them on to some partner companies of ours, or or yeah. those who have uh, work share agreements with our partners. Yeah. So so Ubiquity yeah. is isn't. I mean, we're not our our target market isn't the general public that's looking to purchase uh, real estate with cryptocurrency. Our product is focused on the title insurance industry and and allowing giving them the ability to settle real estate transactions using cryptocurrency. So my answer, my answer would be if you're looking if you're, you know, uh, you know, a, a home or a, a purchaser of real estate, either land or, you know, a, a developed property, um, just go through the traditional means. I mean, find, find your, your real estate agent and then um, uh, that'll help you purchase it. Or if you obviously you're doing it on your own, but it, it once but once you get to the point where you're actually going to, um, you know, make an offer and then get the property in escrow, at that point, a title company that we that that we've been working with that has has our product and that can actually ha- help facilitate uh, the crypto transaction portion of it, though that that would be who we our our, our customers would be. So you wouldn't necessarily come to us if you're looking to purchase real estate with crypto. 
So back in infrastructure to help grease the wheels of it, making this happen. It's like I, yeah, I bought exactly. my house with crypto and it was a pain in the ass <laughs> to prove to the title company that this money didn't come from drugs. Like they, they had, they, they were, they, I went through much, much, much more due diligence to prove to them that this money came from a legitimate source than I did from anything else that I ever have ever done. Which is insane. Like if you think about it, like what was it less than one fewer than one percent of the transactions that are done through cryptocurrency were ever even done with for illicit means. Well it's it's, it's a public Jesus. narrative and, and they yeah. don't understand it. So they assume that like, oh just all this money came from nowhere. Can you tell us where this came from? It's like, yeah, sure. And then they're like, I don't understand what any of those words mean. Can you try a little harder? And (laughs) this is what I'm talking about, the education aspect. I mean, the industry really doesn't know. I mean, you can be talking, I'm going to purchase it with ETH or, I mean, they don't even know what ETH is. I mean, half the time. Now, I think now, more more so now, they're they're educating themselves on, on, um, you know, this industry. But they have no clue for the most part. I mean, how many Nathan? How many title companies and people in the industry we talk to that know absolutely nothing about this industry? I mean, a lot. They're, they're clueless. I mean, we use a, now? a lot of these words. Yeah, there, there, now, there, okay. there's, there, there are more now. But at the end of the day, I mean, they're yeah. still uneducated about a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We always use that like the mantra of "I don't know what I want, but I don't want that." So they kind of came to us. Well, we want blockchain, but we don't want that. Oh, never mind. We're, we're never mind. We're just too busy. We're doing too many transactions. Talk to you later. And now the the tables have sort of turned, and they're coming to us, which is nice. Uh, makes all, all of our lives easier. So now we're we're getting these people signing up because we're we're actually adding an extended benefit to the industry rather than oh well, maybe we're adding these efficiencies which are going to maybe hurt title insurance companies or take away your jobs they took our jobs you know south park but yeah. um I, I think smart i think i know that smart escrow is just going to add to that because they won't have to go through another service again you know not to trash bitpay i think bitpay is offering a, a, a solution in my mind a halfway solution but we really are, are going full force with uh with smart escrow you know having a real objective of having uh, of not having an off off ramp into fiat and keeping it within crypto keeping it within a stable coin and then we're building it on just a, just a tech part of things um on proton because they offer four different stable coins and we've got good support through them they're one of our uh, infrastructure partners proton so, can you who, who proton yeah. what is that uh proton chain and i think it's a fork of eos eos i'll take a look at it right. yeah they're uh, based in san francisco been around for about five years uh, uh, real quick you know it's and then before we run out of time, I, I promised to my team members, I give them shout outs. So shout out to Tatiana O'Brien, our VP of marketing, and uh, Ignacio Landes Duin, senior global client account manager. So, <laughs> yeah, like we, can, we can just use this time to wrap up. Like, what uh, are any questions you wish we would have asked that we didn't? And yeah. uh, if not, tell us, tell people where to find you, where to learn more, and how to get, how to get involved. No, you guys asked great questions. It was awesome. Um, I, I would say that uh, ubiquity.io. So U B I T Q U I T Y dot I O. We're based in the Indian Ocean. No, we're not. Uh, the I O and uh, Smart Escrow dot US is actually um, our our main uh, product that we're focused on, flagship product that we'll be launching at the end of September. And uh, demos are available now for the title, escrow, underwriters, banks, and investors. Uh, and that's uh, yeah, we're not selling securities. So <laughs> disclaimer. Um, yeah, not an offer to sell securities. So, but yeah, those people can basically sign up. So, uh, do you need to ask your trademark? Well, sorry, what was that's that? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Trademark questions. I, yeah. I'll I'll go around the uh, around the. I was going to say the room, but there's really no room here. But we'll we'll say room. <laughs> um. So so Nathan, I'm going to yeah. ask you my trademark question, which is, is what you do actually difficult? Is what I do difficult? And what I mean is like on a day-to-day basis is what you do difficult or is being in crypto, doing what you're doing, starting, you know, this company, is this, is this difficult? Like what are, what is the biggest difficulty for you in general, I guess, and in what you do? When we first started, I think it was education and uh, just getting our first customers, uh, mm-hmm. having someone put the risk, you know, take the risk into putting their money into our company and, and, and the promise of what we were trying to build, uh, originally with unanimity and APIs and, and, you know, the oracles, uh, I think 
it, it was hard raising money a couple of years ago. I think especially when COVID happened, uh, that was a really rough year last year. Um, when that kind of, you know, that churned, we got a lot of investment. I think that that made it easier. So what's the biggest challenge today is um, probably just keeping up with the email demands and ensuring that our team is working in a cohesive manner and everyone is like all hands on deck during these busy times. It's been the best year ever. So it's mostly just about managing team members and ensuring everyone's is doing their job. <laughs> Which a difficult task. Good to work. <laughs> and uh, since we've asked you a few times now, Nathan, we can we can ask Wes this time. I, I'm yeah. assuming Darcy is not able to hear us. If she is, she can answer as well. Wes, uh, yeah. in ten words or less, can you describe Bitcoin? In ten words or less, can I describe Bitcoin? Um, uh, decentralized. Uh, money essentially uh, yeah, that allows anybody to access it in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a means that's transparent and twelve um, words. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, I obviously <laughs> you put me on the spot. And I, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> I wish I would have been able to to, to come up with a better answer. But I, honestly, for for me, it's been. Uh, I mean, obviously, I don't want to take away from this, but um, uh, and take it any, any any longer. But um, it, it's just it's. It, it it opened my mind up to so many so many aspects of of things that I uh, like I I didn't even know how money was created until I, I first learned about Bitcoin. Um, I know that's not that's not your question, but um, it's it's just it, I, I've I've learned so much about uh, about money creation and, and I learned about Austrian economics. I learned about um, uh, this technology and and how it can really you know uh, uh, free people from uh, our, our current monetary system. That's had a stronghold on us for so many years, but um, but it seemed to be getting co-opted again by the by uh, the current system, which troubles me. But in any event, I know that wasn't your your answer. I had a horrible response to that. Like, no, no, the ruminations are great, Wes. <laughs> I, That's I, the I whole point of asking the question. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> Well, y'all, uh, thanks for coming on the show again, and we'll not wait so long to bring it back on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thanks, guys. Thank so, you, guys. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, y'all.